Hello, my name is Talip Küçükcan. I would like to welcome you on behalf of the DRD World Forum Digital Debates. Today we are going to have an interesting debate on the concept of West and Westlessness. The West this is described in different ways, whether it represents a civilization, whether it represents a block, whether it represents a, a set of values. So we will uh, be looking at it uh, while there is a rise in demand for multipolarity in the global world. I have three excellent guests today. Let me introduce them to you one by one before we start our debate. Professor uh, Charles Kopchan, welcome to our program. Professor Kupchan is a professor of international affairs in the School of Foreign Service and Government Department at Georgetown University and a senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. Professor Kupchan from 2014 to 2007 served as a special advisor and assistant to the president and senior director for European affairs on the staff uh, of the National Security Council in the Obama administration. He was also a director for European affairs on the National Security Council during the first Clinton administration. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Uh, uh, Kopchan. Professor Stepan Chan joins us from London. He is a professor of world politics at the School of Oriental and African Studies in London. Uh, he was a civil servant uh, involved with several key diplomatic initiatives in Africa, helping to pioneer modern electoral observation and he continues to be seconded to diplomatic assignments today. Uh, he was also administrator at SOAS, he was a dean, and also he published 35 books. He's a very prolific writer, and he won the 2010 International Studies Association Prize called Eminent Scholar in Global Development. Our third speaker is from King's College, again from London, Domitilla Sagramosa. She is a lecturer in security and development uh, studies at King's College. She is an expert on Russian affairs and Russian foreign policy with a particular interest and expertise on jihadi uh, violence in the Russian North Caucasus. She is currently working on a project on Russia, the near abroad and the Ruski Mir paradigm. Welcome to our program. And let me begin with uh, Professor uh, Kupchan. As I said, we are going to look at the concept of West and its relevance today. How is our increasingly multipolar world impacting the West self-understanding as a strategic bloc? How are traditional relations between Western powers being redefined today, Mr. Kopchan? The floor is yours. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Talib, for, for hosting this conversation and look forward to having a a good dialogue with, with my colleagues over the next hour. You know, in some ways, the, the challenge that we face today is, is much more complicated than we thought that it would have been, say, 10 years ago. I think it was safe to say that had we looked forward a decade ago, we would have seen a multipolar world emerging. Two major superpowers, the United States and China, a host of other players, the EU, Russia, India, uh, Brazil, Indonesia. But we would not have also suggested that the West, as we know it, would have stumbled so profoundly that the anchor of liberal democracy would have been so challenged by populism and illiberalism. And so I think looking forward, we have two concurrent challenges. One is to refound, rejuvenate, revive the, the liberal core, to make sure that in the United States, in Canada, in the UK, in Western Europe, liberal democracy is rock solid. And we don't, we can't say that with any confidence today. You know, I, I, I live in Washington, DC. I, the, four, the last four years before Joe Biden was elected were the scariest years of my life. I've never, never could I have imagined that illiberalism and racism and uh, hostility to the free press could have dominated in the United States. And, and so 
Uh, I'm I'm confident that Biden is leading the country back in a democratic direction, but I can't say that it's durable. I don't know that the Democrats will win the House in the midterm elections. I can't tell you that Trump or son of Trump or daughter of Trump will win the 2024 election. So this is this is a very important, very uncertain moment. And then the second issue, assuming that we can refound liberal democracy, is to figure out how to shepherd the arrival of a multipolar world. In many respects, since the end of the Napoleonic Wars in 1815, the world has been anchored by either Pax Britannica or Pax Americana. Those days are over. China will soon have the world's largest economy. We need to figure out how to preserve a rules-based international system in a world that will be multipolar, not dominated by a liberal Western power and not anchored by any particular system or country. We're headed into a world of ideological diversity. We need to figure out how to preserve stability in that world. Well, thank you very much for contextualizing the debate, actually. We have started, I think, uh, quite well. Now, let me move on to um, Professor Chan from University of London. Professor Chan, as we uh, look at the world today, there are uh, regional uh, integration of different countries. Uh, on the one hand, we can see that uh, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, on the one hand, and also North America, again, New Zealand, Australia, and also in South Asia, we can see another grouping. How you can see the relationship of those, uh, let's say, new alignments and regional integration with that of the West uh, as a block? Well, again, let me repeat that I also am very happy to be here and happy to be with my colleagues on this particular program. Countries like Australia and New Zealand have long had a very, very strong regional cohesion and this extends into the South Pacific, so that the small South Pacific islands are in one way or another part of the orbit of both Australia and New Zealand. And they shared this also with a very, very deep interest in Asia. So the whole idea in the South Pacific countries is how to live with Asia, particularly in terms of the somewhat the aggressive attitude of China with regard to territorial expansion in the Asian seas. This impacts directly on the countries on that part of the world, so that alliances that might be formed are, let us say, facing challenges, and they're not always completely united. New Zealand, for instance, won't allow American nuclear warships into its harbors. This has caused a very great deal of tension in the relationship between two Western allies. But I think that alliances, cohesion of regional blocks is only possible when there's some kind of economic commonality. And this is why Europe works, and because of that cohesiveness in terms of economic interaction, in terms of many countries being in fact a part of the uh, Euro zone. Without that kind of cohesiveness, I don't really think you're going to have regional blocks that can be guaranteed to hold their own. Many, many attempts in Africa, for instance, where I spent a lot of my time, that regional cohesion, all of which fail because there's no cement uh, to keep the cohesion together. And this is the byproduct of development, of course, and volatility within individual countries. Uh, but at the same time, the striving for some kind of union, even on a regional basis, is something which is lacking. And the interesting thing is that it's being challenged right now by jihadist insurgencies, for instance, uh, throughout many parts of Africa, including more recently in Mozambique, and trying to get some kind of cohesion together so that there is a military reply and so that there is an ideological reply that can actually engage and, let us say, 
and dialogue, debate, and knowledgeable, as it were, contradiction of militant jihadism. None of that is apparent in any of the African regional blocs that are confronted by the jihadist phenomenon. So without cement, you can talk about regional blocs all you like, but without that kind of binding capacity, it's going to be rhetoric and talk. Uh, can we uh, put all these countries under the umbrella of uh, Western bloc? Is it uh, easy today? I mean, under the West, or you have to reconfigure uh, the uh, Western bloc today, given the uh, disparities and difference among the countries? Basically, when I'm in Africa, uh, the temptation to deal with China is immense. Chinese are very, very adept at putting upfront sweeteners to persuade people to enter into relationships with long-term consequences. Some countries negotiate very well with China. I'm thinking about Angola and I'm thinking about Ethiopia in particular. But some countries negotiate in a very, very poor way. So building up capacity is important, but because of the overtures of the Chinese, this does weaken the outreach of the West. In other words, when you're in a situation of development, uh, you're looking for help with those problems of development. And if the West can't match what the Chinese are prepared to put in, even if the Chinese hope to have significant gains for themselves in the long-term future, but if the West can't match that, then it's a, a one-horse show. And so there's a degree of a loss of Western influence, to be sure. Uh, there's a lot of Western soft Power. People are still very much attracted to the idea of a Western lifestyle. Western music, for instance, is still very popular. Hip hop among young people, but sung with uh, lyrics and local language is always a very interesting sort of uh, experience. But yes, apart from that, there is a waning of the influence of the West. When you look at Asia, uh, similarly, always looking over your shoulder at what China wants to do. Uh, and you know, where is the Western umbrella? Uh, how much can one depend on that? And of course, the epicenter of the contest between Western influence and all kinds of other influences is the Middle East. So the question of Iran, the question of Israel, all of these things are going to test all kinds of great powers, Western or otherwise. And as you yourself know very, very well, all kinds of diplomatic activities and initiatives are underway at this very moment in time over this very issue of how to have influence in the Middle East. Well, thank you, uh, Professor Chan. I think uh, the Western hegemony is being tested and also challenged uh, in many ways. Now, I think one of the challenges, Russia, of course, now uh, I'll, I just would like to move to uh, Domitilla. Uh, it's been long held that Russia has historical grievances towards the West. We see it, I think. Uh, all the time. Uh, the Western-dominated international system is also contested and challenged by, by Russia. Uh, sometimes uh, the, the Russia sees itself in the West, but when we talk about the Western strategic thinking, it is uh, out of it. To what extent in this context does it this actually drive Russian strategic thinking towards the West beyond its traditional sphere of influence? Uh, thank you very much, Talib. And again, I want to thank uh, uh, you for inviting me and, and my colleagues to discuss these issues. Uh, my, my straight answer is definitely it, it has a lot of impact. Uh, Russia is, is um, since the late 1990s, is very worried about a variety of developments. Uh, and the perception is that uh, on the one hand, uh, within the European context, this began in the late 1990s with um, not only NATO enlargement, but also um, sort of NATO, uh, NATO sort of um, out of area strategic approach and its operations in Kosovo, its military intervention there. Uh, and also then, of course, uh, in uh, 2003 with intervention in Iraq, which occurred outside uh, of the UN Security Council without approval. So uh, there's a lot of concern about what uh, we describe as a humanitarian intervention, so military intervention uh, to support or protect uh, human rights. Uh, there is a lot of concern that a lot of decisions are taken, uh, not only in the European context, but beyond, uh, without taking Russia's interests into account. 
Uh, and this also translates in a perception of being sort of encircled by the West. Um, and <clears throat> this, of course, uh, reinforced with uh, the notions of NATO enlargement and EU <clears throat> enlargement, excuse me, which are perceived as sort of building new dividing lines uh, in Europe. And uh, <clears throat> more than anything, there is a perception that um, the West is intent on sort of weakening Russia. I mean, we might agree or disagree, but this is very much something that uh, since Putin came to power has been reinforced. So that really drives very much of the strategic thinking uh, today in uh, Union Russia. And there is a very strong uh, sense that um, Russia now wants to make sure that uh, the international system uh, is based on sort of clear rules of the game uh, that they also participate in setting up. So that would include at least officially respecting international law and uh, respecting sort of uh, internal affairs or non-interference in internal affairs, um, an emphasis on uh, sort of on the role of the United Nations where they play a very important role, but also sort of non-officially and sometimes said very openly that Russia uh, is one of sort of the leading, you know, global powers and that um, its interests have to be recognized. Uh, and also that it has sort of this traditional sphere of influence around its borders where it has to have a sort of an, an exclusive, to a certain extent, almost an exclusive right of, of, of operation. Uh, but this comes, of course, hand in hand with this notion of multipolarity, uh, this idea that there are going to be different and, and, you know, different poles of power in the world, what was mentioned by uh, Professor Kupsham, Kup uh, and uh, very much this idea that there are different sort of civilizations uh, with different values uh, and that uh, they need to be respected. Um, so they do not, uh, they, they strongly, you know, Russia at the moment strongly rejects this notion of sort of, uh, you know, of, of democratic human rights values and liberal democracy as being promoted, for example, by, you know, by the West as sort of a binding factor. So very much now Russia is moving away, moved away very much from sort of a Western centric um, or, you know, model of organization. And it doesn't really care very much. I mean, the leadership doesn't really care very much what the West thinks about Russian internal affairs. So there is very little sort of capacity to influence internal affairs inside Russia at the moment. Okay, we will come back to Russia actually and its uh, critical uh, views on the Western hegemony. Now, uh, coming back to uh, Professor Kupchen again, in the first round, you talked about the um, values threatened uh, recently by the rise of uh, um, racism, discrimination, uh, populism uh, in the West. Now let's look at the um, strategic interests of the West. Can we uh, describe that there is a um, clearly identifiable set of strategic interests of the West today, given the uh, uh, different approaches of the EU, US, Australia, Canada, uh, which are all considered to be part of the West? Well, I would say that in terms of identifying priorities and ranking strategic interests, the first priority, the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, all have to do with us, not with external threats. They have to do with refounding liberal democracy, making sure that the average Americans and Europeans feel they are earning a living wage. Uh, you know, I, I never thought that the United States would pass through a period as, as unsettling and disruptive as the past four years. And it's not the US alone that has experienced this. In the United Kingdom, Brexit has pushed the U the UK in a in a direction that I, personally I find self defeating. In Poland, in Hungary, in Turkey, we see illiberal forms of democracy ascending. Uh, 
And so the first priority from my perspective is to make sure that the that the way of life that Americans and Europeans together worked so hard to build and to lock in over the course of the last 80 years remains. And I, and I can't say that with confidence that that will be the case. Biden may lose the House in the next ele election. Biden may not be reelected. And what happens then? We're going to go back to something that, that could resemble Trump. So as far as I'm concerned, our top strategic priorities are to make sure that liberal democracy and tolerance and pluralism uh, survive. That having been said, uh, you know, I would say that the, the, the big issue of our time externally is China. China will soon have the world's largest economy. China has 1.4 billion people. The United States has around 330 million people. Russia is a troublemaker, but it is not going to shape, define, craft the 21st century. China is changing the world. And as a consequence, the United States, its European allies, and, and I would actually put Russia into this category, need to figure out what it means to be in a world that is globalized and interdependent, tethered together like we've never been before, whether it's economics, pandemics, global extremism, nuclear proliferation. We have to figure out how to work across ideological dividing lines because none of the big challenges that we face today, preventing climate change, preventing proliferation, stopping global pandemics, that will not occur without work across ideological dividing lines. And so I'm uncomfortable with President Biden's portrayal of a new cleavage between autocracy and democracy. Democracies know how to work together. They've been doing it for decades. What we need to figure out is how democracies and non-democracies can come together to tackle the big global challenges of our time. That, to me, is the big challenge of our day. Well, thank you very much. I think you looked at the uh, West and the beyond when it comes to the global challenges. And you mentioned China, of course, but China is also mentioned by the leaders at the NATO summit uh, uh, a few uh, days ago in, in Brussels. Now, uh, Professor uh, Chan, uh, as a um, key Western institution, uh, the NATO declared that China, at least mentioned, China is a strategic threat to, uh, to, to the uh, NATO alliance. Uh, how might the potentially divergent responses to a rising China from Europe and the US uh, impact Western strategic outlooks? And also, may I also ask you whether China poses a threat to NATO, Europe, and the West? I think the Chinese definitely pose economic competition for the West of a very, very significant nature. I think Charles is quite right that it's going to be the world's largest economic power. And already its influence and its leverage is everywhere. After the 2008 banking crisis in the West, for instance, China bought up so much American toxic debt that its leverage in the American economy is much more significant than people think. So the Chinese think they're strategically well placed in terms of economics and their expansion in the emerging and the developing world is, as I said before, very significant. Now, having said that, I don't think that outside of the Asian region that the Chinese pose any kind of military threat. I don't think they pose a strategic threat. They might want to. So I'm drawing a very clear distinction between ambition and present capacity. And when you look at their present naval capacity, sure, they've got one sort of state-of-the-art aircraft carrier and one refurbished Ukrainian aircraft carrier. Uh, that one is not very much to write home about. Uh, 
but their basic naval capacity is very, very much under par when you look at the combined naval capacities of the Western powers. So in terms of projecting power militarily, they simply can't do it. They posture very well. And I think the West has taken a certain amount of alarm at uh, the posturing. But all, almost every single respect, their technological capacity in terms of the technology they put into their war machines, their airplanes, for instance, is not up to the standard of the West. They're a nuclear power, but when you again look at the configuration of their nuclear weapons and the number of warheads they have, it's just a few hundred as opposed to the several thousands upon thousands that Western countries led by the United States have. So enough for a deterrent, but not really enough for a significant threat that can't be easily countermanded by far more significant threat from the West. So the big, big difficulty for the West is economic. Now, there is a military outreach in the Asian region. The claiming of land, claiming of island territories, for instance, uh, the threats towards Taiwan, the tightening up of basically an ownership of Hong Kong and the illiberalism that is now being cast upon Hong Kong. All of these things are militarily underpinned. But beyond Asia, I don't think that China can militarily underpin its outreach. And when they have tried, and I've seen them in action, to send peacekeeping troops to countries like Sudan, for instance, it's quite clear peacekeeping troops are totally out of their depth and pale in comparison to the Canadian troops, the Ukrainian troops, and the Kenyan troops that I saw. I'm, I'm, in I think she said 315. So China postures much, it talks much, it waves a big I'm, stick. I'm free at, at two. It doesn't actually have a major say. Okay. Okay, go ahead, Professor Chan. Did you finish? No, uh, yeah. Yeah, so just uh, an end piece. I think that the West is wise to have China very, very much embedded in its strategic scenarios. You've got to game plan with China in mind. I think the reality at this moment in time is the Chinese can't actually match the game plan that the West suddenly sometimes ascribes to it. Okay, uh, thank you. Now let's move on to Russia because Russia is also seen as uh, as a competitor, as a threat, sometimes as a challenge to the uh, Western uh, uh, policy uh, circles and Western uh, thinking. Uh, Domitilla, does Russia really pose a strategic threat to the West? Uh, if so, in what ways? What are the limits of that threat? What? How serious is that threat? As Professor Chan said, China cannot militarily threaten the West, but economically, yes, it is a big power. What is the case uh, with with Russia? And to what extent Russia's policy in Ukraine, in Crimea, is seen as a challenge to the Western dominance, as a power that will uh, sometimes uh, uh, play a disruptive role in the region. Thank you. Well, as opposed to China, in a way, Russia is seen as primarily a, mil uh, a sort of a military power, not 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 so much as an economic power. And uh, we we all are familiar with its sort of military, uh, conventional, and nuclear capabilities, uh, which are sort of in many ways matching uh, Western and in some areas even surpassing. Uh, Western uh, capabilities in some some niche areas, uh, but what is really uh, relevant is that Russia has shown in the last years that it's ready to use its military power to pursue its strategic interests. Uh, so uh, it really uh, it, it uses it uh, instrumentally in a way that uh, is is not uh, common to the West, uh, and uh, and I think that is what uh, you know the West um, needs to or knows or is aware of and and is very worried. Uh, and most recently, a few uh, months ago, uh, Russia mobilized a really highly significant number of troops on the border on its borders with Ukraine and uh, with its uh, sort of um, air defense shield you know it, it really posed very serious challenges and concerns uh, to the west and to nato so in the you know the european theater and, and primarily around ukraine you know this this is an issue of constant concern because uh, with the annexation of Crimea and, and sort of the involvement in, in the Donbass in eastern Ukraine, Russia really turned into a revisionist power. 
so this is this uh, you know from the European perspective is a very serious challenge. Um, so sort of the redrawing of borders with the use of force. Uh, justified on the basis of, of, of some kind of uh, internal, uh, internally run referendum. Uh, so definitely, I mean, and Russia also intervened, uh, you know, in Syria, as we know, uh, you know, unexpectedly for the West. Um, some might argue that their intervention had some positive outcomes. I mean, this is open to debate. I think that uh, it really um, um, created a lot of challenges for the West and for the United States and the US-led coalition. Uh, and it also operates in the Eastern Mediterranean and, and even has a presence in, in Libya and in, in many countries in Africa. It competes with the French uh, and with the Americans there. So, uh, you know, it, it, Russia is a real challenge in many areas. And we can go even further and think about Latin America, Venezuela, you know, support for Cuba. So, I mean, Russia certainly, you know, exercises its, its, its power, uh, you know, with, with reach. So uh, the leadership is very effective at maximizing uh, its its military resources uh, but of course economically russia is is, is much weaker uh, and the system is is not open it's not competitive uh, and and the economy is not growing very fast um and of course you know there is a disruptive capability internally uh, you know in terms of disinformation cyber security uh, you know we know that from the united states elections to european elections uh, elections to the european parliament uh, and of course uh, you know support for right, far right parties which is a great concern and i share uh, in that respect very much uh, charles's analysis of our concern about illiberal democracies uh, very close ties with certain regimes in Europe that are not very democratic. Uh, and of course, you know, areas that are very vulnerable geographically because they're very close to Russia as the Baltic states. So, you know, Russia sort of operates in that area quite effectively uh, sometimes uh, with sort of cyber campaigns and disinformation campaigns. And, and there is a constituency in, in Europe that sort of, um, you know, it's not, of course, in a majority, but uh, sort of sympathizes with some of the propositions uh, that come forward from Russia, especially, uh, you know, Putin presenting Russia as sort of as the leader of a of a counter values culture of, of the traditional conservative values. Uh, so that appeals to many in Europe who are not very familiar with what is happening inside Russia. So the image of Putin as a strong man, as an as effective and, and, you know, individual, I think is, is, is something that, you know, should worry us because uh, there is very limited information. And, uh, and the, the sort of the counter narratives can be very, very appealing and, and sort of what we call the whataboutism, you know, putting pointing out to our own weaknesses, as he did in the in the press conference after the G7, you know, which for us who follow Russia, we're so used to it and we don't pay any attention. But I, I noticed that many commentators were sort of picking on this as something very relevant. So I do think that Russia does pose a threat, but I think at the same time that uh, as was shown in this last um, uh, meeting or, or sort of this uh, first meeting for Biden, but uh, you know, with, with, with Putin, I mean, there are ways that one can manage this. And I think that there have been some very interesting outcomes and an understanding that we can sort of recognize our differences and, you know, contain each other in some way and find ways in which we do not sort of um, overreact and, and end up in some kind of collision. Because from the Russian perspective, especially since 2014, I mean, the Russians feel they're almost at war with the West. And we haven't really paid much attention, uh, you know, beyond certain circles. So I think that, uh, I think for, the, for Putin, that was a very interesting and important moment. Also sort of a recogni recognition of Russia as a, as a global player, as I was mentioning earlier. So I think that, yes, definitely, but, uh, you know, there is a way to address this and to manage it. I don't think that there is an inevitable collision course. Well, thank you very much. Now, let's uh, move on to transatlantic relations, because the uh, Europe is part of the West. Of course, the U.S. is uh, part of the West as well, leading, actually, actors within the Western Hemisphere. Uh, Professor uh, Kupchan, there has been a lot of uh, talk in European circles, especially during the Trump era, actually, that uh, Europe needs uh, to establish some sort of strategic uh, autonomy. And also some European leaders talked about European defense uh, units or the European army, European Union army. How does this impact upon Europe's relationship 
with the United States and what are the implications of these impacts for the traditional Western alliance? Maybe Biden will have a different thinking, but what is the picture? What would be the implications if such demand uh, rises in the West as far as their uh, strategic autonomy is concerned? Well, uh, Talap, I think that the the visit of President Biden to Europe went very well. And there is a sense on both sides of the Atlantic that solidarity, common interest are back. And, and, and I agree with that. The $6 million question, which none of us on this call can answer is how long is this gonna last? How long will Biden be in power? To what degree is uh, Biden's election an indicator of a very long-term shift in the pendulum back toward the political center? Everybody's asking that question. Nobody can answer it because we don't know. Uh, and we're just going to have to wait and see how Congress deals with the infrastructure proposal, with voting reform, with health care, with child care, with all the other big domestic programs that Biden wants to pursue. Because in my mind, he's right. If we don't repair the United States from the inside, we're not going to, to be able to return to a more traditional internationalist, multilateralist foreign policy. Trump was in many respects a, um, a, a reaction to the view that of many Americans that there was too much world and not enough America. And Biden is now trying to address that in a much more constructive way than Trump. Now, to come directly to your, to your question, I think that that strategic autonomy is, uh, in some ways, it, it's a false dichotomy in the sense that does Europe need to become more capable? Yes. Does Europe need to become more autonomous? Well, if that depends on what happens on this side of the Atlantic. And so I think that we, instead of debating whether we should see more European capability that is capable of creating an autonomous Europe, the question should be, where's the beef? Where's the capability? What can Europe do? And I'm confident that if Europe becomes more capable, has more military force, has more lift, is able to speak with more of a single voice on foreign policy, the US will actually stay put in Europe. It will see Europe as a more capable partner. And so I don't really think we have a big choice here. There is no big debate. We need Europe to become more capable military, militarily. The United States will deal with uh, the Europe that it has, and it will be a good partner of Europe. The big question in my mind is really, what about the outside world? And here I'll just end with a quick comment on the, uh, on the points that Domatilla and Stephen made. I think that, that folks understand that the big issue of our time is China. It's not Russia. China is the growing power. China will change the 21st century. And I'm guessing that behind the scenes in Washington, in Brussels, in London, in Berlin, in Paris, folks are beginning to think about how they can peel Russia away from its Eastern orientation, how they can put distance between Beijing and Moscow, because in many respects, dealing with the rise of China will be easier if there isn't a close friendship between Russia and China. And to be honest, if I were in the Kremlin, and I were looking east, I would be much more worried about China than I would about NATO. I would be much more worried about Chinese incursions into Central Asia, into the Arctic, 
border disputes, China's growing military and economic power than I would about what Russia, uh, what, what, what NATO was doing in Georgia or Ukraine or, or anywhere else. So my, my guess is that we're going to see a pivot within Russia in response to the growing Chinese uh, uh, colossus. So what would be your response to those, especially in Europe, uh, that there is no uh, you know, singular policy towards China? Each and every member of the European Union, uh, I think, uh, does have different policy. Some is tough, some uh, are not very tough. How do you think that will play out in the Western alliance as uh, European Union or Europe itself uh, presents uh, as a power? Well, you know, it's a, it's an excellent question because I think that what we saw during Biden's trip is that if you want to have a consensus on China, you need to take a more moderate approach. When he was home, he talked about a clash between democracy and autocracy. We will win, not China. If you look at the G7 communique or the NATO summit communique, it was more modest. And I think that's because nobody in Europe is looking for a big fight with China. Germany's largest trading partner is China. So as a consequence, we need to find that middle ground. Stephen was talking about this a few minutes ago. We need to find that a way of dealing with a China that will have the world's largest economy, that will not be a democracy, but at the same time is uh, going to shape the 21st century. Uh, and so in many respects, we're heading into uncharted waters. We have never lived in a world that is interdependent, globalized, but not guided by either Pax Britannica or Pax Americana. That's the world we're headed into. We need to figure out how to make that work. Uh, thank you very much, uh, 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 Professor Kupchan. Now, let me turn to uh, Stefan Chan. There is a, a similar question to you, but in a different, uh, maybe, context. Uh, there is a, a rising, I think, populism on the one hand, uh, Brexit on the other hand, and also this European quest for strategic autonomy and very critical thinking of the uh, US and European policies in Africa, in, in Asia, and elsewhere. So can all these things amount to a desire for restlessness as being more a uh, multipolar world, or this is a exaggerated notion? This is my first question. The second question uh, related to this is that the rise of uh, Russia, China, uh, India to some extent, and a lot of countries in the uh, South Asia, do you think uh, these will uh, uh, pose a threat to the maintenance of strategically coherent Western community? Well, I think the big challenge for the West is precisely to understand all of these quite disparate growths of influence and power. It seems, for instance, just to discuss the very last country you mentioned, Indonesia, almost no understanding in the West that with Indonesia, this is the world's largest Islamic population. And yet there's been no outreach whatsoever to try to treat Indonesia in sympathetic terms that accord with Islamic values of a modern sort. So getting the head around that combination of modernity and belief is something the West has not been very good at. The secular revolutions of the last few hundred years in the West really could be its downfall in terms of appreciating dynamics in other parts of the world. Similarly, when looking at places like Africa, look, uh, I'm going to absolutely be in Charles's court here. The damage caused by President Trump's reference to African countries as shithole countries, and, you know, those are his words, not anybody else's, did such profound damage to the sense that America is a civilized country uh, that it's going to be very difficult for President Biden to try to repair it. As for Africa, President Xi presidents before him have made regular visits to African countries, uh, whereas this has not been matched by Western leaders and not by American presidents, for instance. So the feeling as well, if they don't want to take us seriously, why should we 
put our balls in their court. Here's the Chinese offering us all kinds of incentives to play with them. Uh, we at least have alternatives now. Uh, at least some of the Chinese offerings are very, very attractive in terms of our development needs. So it seems that the West has not really reached out to the emerging world in a way which the emerging world recognizes as sympathetic. It reaches out to the emerging world with Western interests in mind. Now, the Chinese are actually amazingly good at disguising the fact that they're putting their interests also into the frame. They're very good at a propaganda approach, basically, to portray themselves as helpful older brothers, a very Confucian approach to the international diplomacy and international aid. So being able to find the right wavelength to deal with countries of very different backgrounds, very different ideological and faith orientations, that's something that escapes the West. The West has not been good at it. And insofar as it refuses, it seems to me, to become good at it, it does lead very, very much, in my view, to a sense of Westlessness emerging in the world. And for that, the West can only blame itself. Looking at itself as the template for the world is not the way to engage a world which is rapidly growing in terms of its own beliefs and its own values. Right. Uh, that reminded me uh, one thing that, uh, you know, the Europe had a colonial uh, past in Africa, in, in Asia. So that made uh, and left a uh, big legacy, actually. China didn't have that kind of relationship in, in Africa uh, uh, in particular. Do you think that makes a difference uh, in their approach and in their reception by the, by the local actors? It does to a certain extent, particularly in terms of trying to use diplomatic leverage. Uh, this is a card that can always be played. At the same time, Western influence and Western prestige is still very, very much present. Uh, in the anglophone countries, everyone wants to send their children to uh, a British university. If they can get into Oxford, Cambridge or London, uh, so much the better. Uh, and so, you know, that kind of residue of the colonial experience uh, still is powerful. Same with France. Everyone wants to go to Sciences Po. Uh, so those kinds of things work. However, in terms of the audit sheet, in terms of the pluses and minuses of the colonial experience, and I think that almost every single one of the emerging countries will say that the balance sheet is very much against the colonial powers, and that there's a real case to be made for reparations. This is going to be a growing crusade not only amongst the young people with a conscience in the West, but from the emerging world. Where are the fulsome apologies? Where are these efforts towards reparations? And if not reparations, where are the movements towards fairer trade deals? Uh, so those kinds of things are going to resonate. So it's not just as it were a colonialism of the past. Why do you maintain a neo-colonialism in the present? Discriminatory trade regimes, for instance, all of those kinds of things need to be put on the table and discussed in a serious way by the West. Well, thank you very much. I think that we should spend a little bit more time on Russia. We spent a lot of time on China. Now let's come back to Russia, Domitilla. How significant of a threat to Western solidarity is Russia's attempt at driving wedges into the West traditional strategic fabric? You have briefly mentioned that. Does this reflect Russian strength, or rather a perceptive Russia keen on exploiting pre-existing fractures in the Western alliance? It is very clear that there is, uh, I think, uh, fractures. In other words, our intra-Western fractures are a result of structural factors, or has Russia had a real impact in this regard? Because we know that Russia is trying to intervene in uh, elections in other uh, areas. What would be your uh, insight, uh, Domitila? Thank you, thank you, Talib. Well, definitely, I mean, these this, uh, fractures or, or sort of, of diversions of views and approaches are, are there and, and are not created by Russia, but Russia is very clever at exploiting them uh, to its uh, its benefit. And that's, uh, I mean, on the one hand, there is a long tradition of what we used to call sort of decoupling America from Europe that goes back to the Cold War. And I think there has been a return to that to try to uh, push America away and, and sort of try to see if, if, if Europe can, can become closer to Russia. 
Uh, and this is especially because there is a very strong perception in Russia that Europe uh, or it has no sort of strategic autonomy, also in decision making. It's very hard to convince the Russians that some decisions are made in Europe. Um, and, and therefore, uh, especially when we look, for example, at issues around uh, strategic stability and nuclear forces, I mean, the Europeans don't even participate in these discussions. Uh, so um, we've seen now also the challenges around a, a meeting, you know, between the European Union and, and, and Russia following the Biden-Russia summit. And, and so uh, th there is very much this perception that, um, that you know, that Europe uh, could be sort of decoupled from, from uh, the United States. And I think we, you know, from the European perspective, we, we really felt that we came very close when Trump was the president. And we, we all remember the first meeting at, at, the, at the NATO headquarters and his reluctance to sort of uphold uh, NATO's uh, sort of main, main uh, articles and Article 5. So that was really seen as, as a sort of a moment of triumph. That also Russia sort of exploits uh, internal EU uh, divisions because it, it understands that it needs to work with those countries that tend to have, uh, I would say, a, a less confrontational approach towards um, Russia uh, because of different historical experiences. Uh, so, of course, Eastern European countries are much more reluctant to engage in, in sort of strategic dialogue and make concessions to Russia and uh, sort of French, the Italians or, or the Germans, you know, they, they, they believe that, you know, that there always needs to be some kind of channel of, of communications, of engagement, of dialogue, of trade, you know, the Nord Stream 2 being the best example. But that really divides Europeans. So uh, it really has an impact on how Europe functions uh, because Russia is on its borders. So it's much harder to arrive at a consensus uh, as opposed as to arrive at a consensus on what to do about China, where the differences are there, but they're not as sharp. Um, so I think that certainly Russia sort of tries to operate at that level. Uh, but I think that at the same time, I think the Trump experience has shown the limits. Uh, and, and, and I think that there is certainly probably a side in the Kremlin that prefers someone like Biden with whom they can engage in a constructive dialogue and and it's not by chance that after uh, the Biden um, uh, Putin summit uh, Putin wrote this piece where he really sort of um, rain, rain emphasized again sort of uh, Russia's European uh, heritage uh, so really uh, trying to see if some some kind of, of better relationship can be established but again I mean the, the different perspectives inside Europe make it very difficult. So I, I mean, although I, I, I certainly agree with Charles that you know Russia could could benefit from better relations with Europe and and less reliance on China. They rely very much now on on Chinese um, capital for for financing many of their sort of energy projects um, and 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 many others and the export of their natural resources. So they're really becoming the junior economic partner, although they are very strong on on sort of on their military. Um, uh, sort of cooperation with China. So there would be an argument in favor of Russia sort of decoupling from China. But I think that at the same time, it's, it's not very likely to happen. Uh, the Russians feel that they share many, many uh, similar viewpoints about how the international system should work. And that is very ingrained in the Putin regime. I wouldn't say it's, it's ingrained necessarily in Russia and nothing can change. But certainly the Putin regime very much values the Chinese approach, uh, uh, at least the official one, on international affairs and respect for um, sort of uh, norms of international law and interference in internal affairs. There is a lot of common understanding around Central Asia, around the Shanghai Fora, and the Russians had had to accept the One Belt, One Road and the involvement of China in these areas much more uh, extensively. Uh, but somehow they they kind of they're ready to accept it and uh, they're ready to cooperate also commercially around you know the Eurasian Union and China. So I think that um, you know I mean whether I mean we might want this to happen. I I don't see that really happening. That sort of Russia is pivoting now to 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 the West and, and abandoning China. I think we're going to have many years where the direction is going to be the opposite. 
especially because we are stuck with the Ukrainian crisis and the sanctions. And it's, it's really, really at the heart of our problem now with Russia is the whole question around Crimea, the Donbass, uh, the lack of implementation of the Minsk agreement and the existing existence of sanctions. Uh, so, um, and I think I, I really don't see a, a movement uh, in, in, any, in any direction to resolve that in the short term. Uh, so I'm, I'm not very positive and confident that, you know, we can sort of decouple Russia from China. Thank you. Well, thanks uh, for this comprehensive uh, uh, in, and insightful response. Uh, gentlemen, uh, Professor Chan, Professor Kupchan, if you would like to add something for a minute, you can have uh, one minute each. Uh, otherwise, uh, we can wrap up and finish. I would just say that I, I broadly agree with Yomatila, uh, in part because I think that Putin doesn't have a second course. He's legitimated himself by being the bad boy. He goes into Georgia and then Ukraine and then Syria and then Libya and then Nagorno-Karabakh. And he legitimates his rule at home by flexing his muscles abroad. And the, the Russian economy is, is not in good shape. There's no knowledge economy. It, it's basically still reliant on energy revenue. And so if, if you say, is he ready to pivot to a less confrontational foreign policy? I'm guessing the answer is no. And, 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 and I think Domatila would agree with that. The one, the one caveat I would offer is, is he starting to get uncomfortable with China? Is he going to be ready to be the junior partner for years to come? Because China has the economy, China has the military, China has the perspective on global, uh, on global influence that Russia does not. I will simply end by throwing that out as a question, but it is an important question. Well, in our next debate, we can look at that question. Professor Chan? Yes, just a couple of sign-off words. I think that we're in danger sometimes of over-exaggerating the military capacity of the powers that we talk about. In following the Russian mercenaries in different theaters, in Libya, in Mozambique, where they made a recent appearance, the so-called Wagner group, they're actually awful. If these are ex-Russian soldiers or Russian soldiers in different uniform, I don't think very, very much of their capacity at all. And also in terms of Chinese throwaway, even in terms of traditional infantry confrontation, the Indians have pretty much held their own, although with some bloody noses on the border, confrontations uh, with China, for instance. So I think that we have to be very careful about exaggerating capacities when these have not been evidenced. But I do agree with my colleagues on this very fine show, and put it together very well, that the future is going to be Chinese. So what I would like to say is that when I visit China, uh, they don't treat me as a poor Chinese. They think I'm far too Western to my own good. And half of China seems to think I'm Japanese anyway, because that's what I look like. But you take your car into Beijing from the airport and you can cut the atmosphere like a knife. It's an atmosphere that rings with its our turn now. Every single Chinese that you can speak to will echo that as our turn now. They think the moment of history, not just of economics, but the moment of history is this. Well, thank you very much. I think with that, we come to the end of our debate uh, on uh, Westlessness, multipolarity, and the meaning of the West. Uh, I would like to thank all of uh, our speakers. Uh, Charles uh, Kupchan, Professor of International Affairs at Georgetown University. Professor uh, Stephen Chan at the uh, School of Oriental and African Studies. And also uh, Dr. Domitila Sakramosa. She is a lecturer in security and development studies at King's College. Thank you very much for joining us today. And uh, from all of us, we would like to say goodbye to everyone here uh, from the uh, digital debates of today. Thank you very much for joining us. Have a nice day and goodbye. Thank you, Talab. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.